There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic, where we're joined by one of the cornerstones of British music writing, of such distinguished long service that I used to read him in the Melody Maker when I was at school. It's the great uh, oh, Richard Williams. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a testament, testament not to how, how old we are, but how young you were when you started. <laughs> <laughs> already. <laughs> but it's great Hello, to I'll see you. <laughs> Richard, where are you? You're somewhere near Richmond, aren't you? Because you wrote a lovely uh, yeah, yeah. blog East, the other day about, uh, about all the local rock and roll landmarks. East Twickenham, Transpontine, Richmond. Oh, right. Excellent. Yeah, not far from... You wrote about being near Eel Pie Island and, the, yeah. and, and, where the, and where the Stones used to play. The Station Hotel. And That's Richmond, it. And the, uh, and the rugby club where the Crawdaddy Club transferred to. Yeah. yeah. Not, it's not where I come from, but uh, it's uh, loaded with history. That's for sure. That's right. And you were from well, not uh, was it? Not, were you born in Nottingham, or you grew up in Nottingham? No, I was born in Sheffield and grew up in Nottingham. Yeah. Oh right. Oh, you're Can a Yorkshire. Can you remember? Man. This is the this is the traditional first question. Can you remember the record playing equipment um, in your in your home at the time, and what might have been on it when you were very young? Um, I've still got it. It's a wind up gramophone. Oh really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was my mum's. Yeah, and, um, this is one of the things she used to play. Oh, on. fantastic! And that is a fantastic seventy-eight um, Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin, played by Paul Whiteman and his concert orchestra. The composer at the piano, a two-sided. Oh, oh wonderful! From Days for Records and Radio, sixteen to eighteen, Shambles Street, Barnsley. Oh, that's fantastic. That's amazing. I right. love those days when your people used to, when your record shop used to, you know, have its own branding on the yeah. outside of the thin Yeah, yeah, yeah. Used to advertise to say the fact you could also get bicycles from them usually, couldn't you? Electronic <laughs> 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 equipment. Yeah. Or washing machines. Washing yeah. machines, yeah. <laughs> Two bar electric <laughs> fires. So is it, your mother was a bit of a, a bit of a collector, was she a bit of a... Uh, well, I was man. lucky that both my parents uh, loved music. Um, uh, my dad sang, my mum played piano a bit, um, and they both, they liked classical music, but they also liked dance bands. You know, they'd obviously had a history of dancing when they were younger to Ambrose and Lou Stone and Roy Fox and right. you know, all those people. So there were a few of those records around. So that was, you know, none of that was frowned upon in, in our household. So did you, did you play yourself? You did, didn't you? Yeah. Um, you, you were in a skiffle band, weren't you? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I played various instruments um, with varying degrees of competence, but I was in a skiffle group when I was about, 11 or 12, I suppose, and then uh, in a beat group, and then in a... What was the name of the skiffle group? Can you remember? The group didn't have a name. It was a yeah. rehearsal group. Um, we had a... My dad was a, a, a parson, so we lived in large vicarages. I was very lucky. Oh, so you had rehearsal space. Had space. Um, and the skiffle, the era of the skiffle group, it was over the garage, uh, in a room over the garage. So, you know, I could, I mean, when I took up playing the drums, which is what I did eventually, I could make as much noise as I, as I wanted, which was fabulous. Um, skiffle group didn't have a name, um, but, you know, it was based on the principles laid out in this document. Oh, right, go on, tell us what go this on. is. Go on, you have to read that out, go on. Rock around a uh, rock island. What am I talking about? Rock Island Line, the Lonnie Donegan Skiffle Group. All oh, right. Um, so that was my first, my own first record, seventy-eight. Uh, so this is proper. Um, the band's is proper, you know, biscuit box bass and you know washboard. Yeah, and all yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad yeah. made a tea chest bass, tea chest yeah. um, with a, a sort of broom handle and a yes a piano wire. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and my mum's washboard um, and uh, a thing called a banjo lele, which was half banjo, half ukulele. Yes, yes. Um, which I still have somewhere. Um, and it was rudimentary, but you know, 
a gateway. It, yeah. it is the it's the it's just fantastic to think there was a time when most households had a washboard and a tea chest. So the, the idea of the tea chest is the extraordinary idea, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good a good way into everything. All that was. So when you when you became the beat group, well, can you remember the name of the beat group? Yeah, it was called the Pacifics. That oh, was right. proper, that was proper group. And of course, you know, that was right, one, of the, of one of the things we were listening to at the time. Couldn't uh, afford the knitwear. No, absolutely. No. <laughs> it's fantastic knitwear, isn't it? Did all you the, have any dance routines? Or the Fender guitars. Um, well, not for you, we if you're were the drummer. Actually, but... actually, we were a bit more rockabilly than that. Um, yeah. I was lucky that the two guys who were the guitarists uh, and singers were more into... The Johnny Burnett trio and yeah. and yeah. kind of thing. So so we did that, and I guess I was about thirteen or something then. And uh, I had a snare drum, a, a cymbal, and a bass drum, and that seemed to be enough, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I do remember we played a function at the local village hall um, with lots of friends of my parents there. Um, it was a sort of a function. Um, and there were people sitting at tables and chairs, you know, being served exotic things like. Um, Black Forest Gatto. <laughs> <laughs> and there were various turns, all sort of local. And it, we were the last. <laughs> and we came on and launched into some rock and roll epic, you know, with our tiny speakers and so on, you know, and minimal drums. And I just remember all these grown ups getting up and fleeing to the back of the hall. <laughs> it's too loud. It was like the sex business. <laughs> Well, I hope you thought, job done, you know. <laughs> Rebellious youth. Uh, completely. Were you paid? Can you remember if you were paid? Oh, no, probably not for that, no. I wouldn't have thought. No, it's pro bono. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and can you remember the first singles you bought, or first records you bought? Well, that Rock on the Line was... That would have been it, yeah, yeah. yeah the first album I personally bought was that. Oh, you see oh right, yeah. yeah, yeah, Glenn yeah, yeah. Story. From the Glenn Miller story, of course. Yeah. Sort of part of an, a very early stage on the journey into jazz. So what year would that be? 61, something like that. Right, right. Hey, do, who do you... Uh, can you remember when you first saw professional musicians on stage live? Uh, yes, that would be dance bands at various local functions. Um, and I always used to go and observe what the drummer was doing very closely. <laughs> yes. Some kind of, you know, do you remember Max Jaffer and the Palm Court Orchestra? Oh, right, yes. Yeah. It would be something. It would Play be the, the fiddle. A yes. Yeah, and a, a sort of sweet saxophone player and, you know, pianist and, and a drummer playing with brushes. But I was always very interested in that. Um, but the first sort of formal thing was Cliff and the Shadows actually at the Odeon in Nottingham um, and I remember that very clearly when I suppose I was 14 um, and of course there were so many girls screaming I couldn't hear what they were doing which was infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't entering into the spirit of this. Can you keep it down please? <laughs> trying to listen to the drum. Well, yeah, what Brian, you know, Brian Bennett had just replaced Tony Meehan as the drummer with the shadows. Of course. Um, and Tony Meehan was one of my early heroes. So I was yes. a little bit annoyed about that, but I wanted to hear what this new chap, Brian Bennett, was doing. Can you remember, and you, you probably will, what kind of technical, what was the technical setup of a group like that in kind of pre-Beatles times? I mean, presumably just very basic camps. Yeah. I mean, no PA or anything like that, well, was there? Yeah, the, the sort of Vox AC, you know, what were they, what were they called? Those sort of columns. The columns, yes. yes. One yeah. on either side of the stage, uh, very minimal, and, and, and an amp for each player. Very, and no, <laughs> no microphones on the drums, or, you know, in those days. No, absolutely. <laughs> it's just a distant racket, wasn't it? <laughs> you had to train your ears, didn't you, really, to appreciate it? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I I think I do think that the musicians in those days had to play with more concern for the balance of the, of the sound. Nowadays, the you know the guy on the mixing desk does it all. Yeah, um, or the person on the mixing desk does it all. Uh, but in those days, you know, I think you know you had to listen, and think about what you you know what you were doing in relation to what the other people were doing. Yeah. So you were you were playing in bands, and uh, were you starting to read music papers? 
Yeah, um, pretty early on, I read the, because I had a very early interest in jazz from the age of about 12, maybe 13, um, I started to read The Melody Maker because that had um, that had more about jazz in it as well as the other stuff. But other people at school read the New Musical Express, so I saw that. Um, and uh, yeah, and I saw Disc, you know, which also had some, quite good writing in it in those days. Um, when did you start trying to write yourself then? Uh, when I was, I think, 15 or 16, I entered the Daily Telegraph Junior Jazz Critic Competition. Oh, wow. Uh, wow, that's amazing. Which might have been judged by Philip Larkin, who was the Daily Telegraph's Jazz Critic Competition. Of course he was. Amazing. And I came second. Uh, <laughs> He's not in a position to deny it, Richard. If I were you, I'd say I was Just say selected it. by Philip Larkin. I mean, Philip, we're going to say it. <laughs> Larkin was a decent poet, but a terrible jazz critic. <laughs> there we are. Um, so I think that was my first attempt. At Who were you writing about? Can you remember? Yeah, I can remember exactly. Um, I wrote about a Gil Evans album called uh, Out of the Cool, still one of my favourite albums. And the winner, whose name I don't remember, but who probably went on to make a fortune in the city, um, reviewed a Charles Mingus album, Tijuana Moods, which was a slightly cooler choice, I have to say. <laughs> so was that the, the was that the incentive to go on and try and write for what? Was it local papers or where did you where did you start writing after that? Uh, I got thrown out of school when I was 17. Um, so I played in a band kind of semi-professionally for a year. Um, oh, really? Around knocking in the east midlands and we we were called the junko partners not to be confused with a similarly named band from newcastle on time um who were doing the same you know we we were doing the basic r b repertoire chuck berry bo Diddley, jimmy reed um muddy waters and we were pretty purist actually about it um, we didn't believe that you should write your own songs you know actually <laughs> <laughs> may have been our downfall um but anyway we had a lot of fun we supported lots of people um screaming jay hawkins oh wow uh, <laughs> somewhere here somewhere here i have a copy of the script now i don't think i'm going to be able to find it never mind um yeah we supported screaming jay hawkins we supported uh, the moody blues when go now was at number one fantastic oh, really? Dungeon Club so that's Nottingham. quite a big venue what quite a big venue if that oh, yeah, yeah, we played some decent places um that was when the moody blues were wearing those double-breasted midnight blue suits yes yeah pretty cool um and tom jones we was just about our last gig we supported tom jones the week it's not unusual got to number one fantastic oh, <laughs> yeah so uh, you were intending to be a professional musician not really um is that what you told your parents uh, oh yeah, they were they were fine, you know. They, yeah. they were okay. I mean, you know, I was seventeen, and I, you know, I'd go out to some far flung uh, bit of the East Midlands and get brought back in a transit at two o'clock in the morning, and they were cool with that. Um, but I think I thought I'd better get a proper job. I didn't think I was ever going to be good enough because um, I was judging myself by the jazz drummers that I listened yeah, to, yeah. who were, of course, you know, fantastic players and. Um, you know, when I was 17, a guy called Tony Williams, who was a few months older than me, had joined Miles Davis, you know, and was revolutionising music. And I thought, I'm probably not going to measure up to that. Um, and I'd always kind of wanted to be a journalist, so I got a job on the local paper and did four with, years. With presumably a kind of music column as being part of it? or Yes, and it was great at the time um, because it was when local evening i was on an evening and a morning paper in nottingham and they knew that there were these people called teenagers and there were quite a lot of them and you know <laughs> interests of their own but all the editors and sub editors and so on were too old to know anything about it so you could do what you you know they give so you, you didn't a, have to clear it with anybody you didn't have to say i'm going to write about velvet underground or whatever yeah well it's funny you should say that <laughs> Here, I just found this the other day. I've been looking for it for years. The Guardian Journal, Nottingham, which was the morning paper, Saturday, November 25th, 1967, which was when the first Velvet Underground oh, right. came oh, out right. in this country in November 67. Yeah, yeah. There we are. 
that? Can you see that? There is a oh, fantastic. review of the first Velvet Underground in, <laughs> in the local paper in Nottingham. That was probably before, Did you get any response to that? That was probably before it was response? in any British music yeah. paper, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, there was a bit in the, there was a paragraph in, in IT, I think. And that was a bit. And that was your lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. you didn't get irate readers saying, I, I bought this record recommended by your music critic. And I, I, I insist on a refund. No. No. <laughs> no. Uh, no, and I wouldn't have taken any notice if I had, but of course, you know, this was before social media, so yeah, feedback yeah. was virtually non-existent, thank goodness. Uh, right. It was great. So I could write about, you know, I don't know, Hendrix or, you know, whatever I wanted to write about. It was great. So, so I, did, did that lead to the melody maker? Yeah, very much, because um, I could build up this fire, you know, I could write about Yes. John Coltrane and Albert Isler, you know, yes. in, the, in the Nottingham Guardian Journal. So I could I built up this file of cuttings that when uh, I went to see the melody maker, you know, I could show them these, you know, I can write about all this stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. That was, so is that what you did? You went went down to London with the with the cuttings and presented yourself and said, to, you know, I'm available. Kind of. Um, who was the editor? Jack Hutton. Yeah. Um, who was the guy who modernised it in the 60s? Uh, and in 69, I'd written, I'd sent him a review on spec from Nottingham, which they'd printed and had liked it. Um, it was actually Maynard Ferguson, the jazz trumpeter, who had come to play at the Palais. Um, and it was quite newsworthy. So I, I thought, anyway, so they printed it. And then the assistant editor, who was a guy called Bob Houston, was leaving and he wrote to me uh, and said, I like that piece and I'm leaving. There's going to be a vacancy. So, you know, if you want to apply, why not? So I did, and I went down and saw Jack Hutton and took my cuttings and got taken on as a kind of, as the most junior person in the office. So who else was there? Yes, who, who Where was? were you in those days? We were, in, we were on Fleet Street, um, no. which was fantastic, you know, to start your career in London on Fleet Street, even if it was the melody maker, you know. It was Absolutely. Wonderful. Opposite Elvina, you know, terrific. Um, <laughs> And uh, Chris Welch was there. Um, who else would you? Most of the people, m m quite a lot of the people who were there moved on within six months or so to start sounds. Yes, yeah, of course, because yes. Jack, Jack Hutton started. Jack too. left yeah. to start sounds and took a lot of people with him. And yeah. Chris, Chris and I were really the only two who, um, who held out, uh, Chris out of sheer loyalty. And I thought, well, I've come down to London, you know, it's, I, I'd come down to London six months earlier to work on the Melody Maker. And that's, you know, because I really liked it and I was you know, pleased with it. Um, I'd actually been turned down by the NME, but I'd written to the NME. I didn't think I was good enough to join the MM. So I thought, well, I'll try the NME. Maybe <laughs> not. Um, well, seriously, that's absolutely Yeah, no, no. Um, and got turned down by Andy Gray. Still got the letter. Um, <laughs> you he's kept the letters, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you'll get even. <laughs> <laughs> At least you've got over it. It's, it's a long game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I didn't go. And Jack Hutton's pitch was, well, we're going to start sounds and it's going to be a left wing melody maker, which is quite appealing. But I thought, well, why don't I stay and try and make the melody maker more left wing? Um, so, so Max Jones must have been there. Max was, of course, Max was there. Max, was where there. the legendary kind of jazz writer who met everybody, hadn't he? Exactly. You know, close personal friends with Louis Armstrong and Billy Holiday and Duke Ellington and everybody, and it was fantastic to share an office with him. Just fantastic. You know, a wearing really, a beret to the office, beret. never seen without his beret. Absolutely. Um, was the Ballad of the Thin Man by, by Dylan? Was that supposed to be a reference no. to him? Well, wasn't that wasn't it? Max. He no, loved no. Dylan. Dylan knew Dylan had heard about Max from John Hammond because yeah. Yeah, yeah. Max knew Hammond very well, um, the producer, because he, you know, Hammond had recorded Count Basie and Billy Holiday and all those people. So when Dylan came to London, Hammond had said, you know, well, if you don't know anybody in London, go and look up Max Jones at the Melody Maker. So indeed, Dylan, this is before my time, of course, yeah. Dylan did turn up uh, and 
Max interviewed him and, you know, because Max knew about the blues and folk and all that stuff. So, you know, Dylan responded quite warmly to him. So the Mr. Jones in Ballad of a Thin Man is not Max Jones in anything. Not Max Jones. Sermon. No. Who did you interview around that time? Did you? Was it Beefheart? I can't remember. And John and Yoko? I'm trying to remember of things you might have. Yeah. yeah. Um, Where was the John and Yoko interview? Um, well, the first one would have been late 69, I think, at Apple. Um, and then I interviewed John two or three times. God, and you would have been, uh, I don't know, what, 22 then, or something? Yeah. And then when... Um, then, I mean, he was so great to interview. You know, I remember once I went to interview him at Apple, maybe the second time, and we had an hour or something, and then he had to go to the TV studios, Thames TV on Euston Road, and he had a limo to take him there. And he said, look, we haven't really finished. Why don't you come? So, I, you know, I, he took me in the limo. We carried on talking, telling me about how, how much he liked the new Lee Dorsey record. Um, and I remember him telling me, but he told me the story about, you know, before they went on stage in the early days, McCartney always used to go around straightening their ties, doing their top buttons up. Great little story. And, you know, I hung around the TV studios while he did his interview there, and then he took me back. I said, that's what he was like. And then when I was going to write a book about Spectre, pretty soon after, maybe 1971 or something, um, I wrote him and said, because he'd been doing, you know, instant karma and stuff with Spectre. I said, can I come and talk to you just about Spectre? And he said, well, he wrote back and said, well, I'm going to New York, um, but uh, uh, I'm very happy to talk, get in touch. So I got in touch again and he said, well, why don't you come to New York? Because I'm going to be recording with Phil and that would be good. So unbelievably, he arranged for me to have a return air ticket and a room at the St. Regis Hotel where he and Yoko were living before they got their apartment and I spent you know I can't remember four or five days um hanging around and going to the same and watching them record watching for uh, happy, happy Christmas was over from beginning to end you know the whole spectre process from beginning to end which you know John made possible um in a very you know quiet kind of way and uh, he was very you know generous person in that way I, I i thought so that was an experience that's astonishing were things arranged in those days without the kind of uh, without intermediaries uh, not exactly i mean if you wanted to talk to a beetle you know you had to talk to derek taylor um but derek there was no question of derek taylor sitting in on the interview or anything <laughs> you know, never ever you know the idea of a pr Yes. The end was just unthinkable and you know you would have walked out if they tried to insist on it so there were you know what layers there were between you and them were very very thin and um, porous yeah yeah so you 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 famously were, were the person that brian ferry contacted when uh, when he wanted to get his demo there it is <laughs> oh my goodness that's wonderful oh Tell us the story. Yes. T- That's it. Um, well, it was a, a day in 1971, and in my diary for that day, um, it says, Brian, somebody, tur- spelt with an I, Brian, somebody, turning up at home with a tape. And I was out, and he left it with my girlfriend. Uh, and that is it. And um, if you want to get in touch with Brian Ferry, ring 223-0296. He's not there anymore. <laughs> you can try. Um, and uh, this was the thing that Brian Eno recorded on his, I don't know, I don't think it was a Revox, might have been. Um, and it's got the Bob Medley, Lady Tron, Grey Lagoons, Bogus Man chance meeting and 2hb in fantastically rudimentary form um and you but you rang him up didn't you did an interview so what was it about that tape that appealed weirdness totally weird um i I sometimes think that maybe i played it you know two tracks simultaneously or something so it sounded even weirder than it And I, you know, I was always interested in experimental stuff. I like experimental jazz. I like experimental rock music, always. Uh, sort of at that stage, the weirder the better. Um, 
uh, and um, this, you know, had a lot of strange stuff on it. And it was the it was a very early lineup with a kind of classical percussionist. Um, it was actually an American uh, draft dodger, I think, something like that. But he was a classical percussionist. And uh, different guitar players and, and, and so on. And rudimentary. And this strange singing, you know, very strange singing at the time. So I thought, well, this is interesting. Um, so I rang him up and we met. I think I took him, I think I interviewed him at the Golden Egg in Fleet. You see, this uh, as the detail I love. <laughs> the Golden Egg. It's the idea of London. It gives you such a wonderful idea of London in those days. Yeah. You know, the, the hippiest place to go was the Golden Egg. Yeah. And... Um, uh, anyway, I liked him very much, and he, he, you know, talked about the Velvet Underground and Charlie Parker and lots of stuff I liked, and um, uh, we got on, so I wrote a piece about him saying how interesting this thing was, and, you know, he was saying, well, we don't really want to hack around the colleges, you know, we, we don't want to pay our dues in the way that everybody was having to at the time, and that was quite... Um, and so Brian Ferry. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. Uh, but he was charming and you know clever, and um, and then I got to meet the others, uh, and I went to I went to the audition they did for E.G. Management to people who managed them and signed them to Ireland, uh, which was in a cinema in Brixton, I think. Um, that was fun, and I, I saw them at the Hundred Club, one of the maybe their second or third gig. And, you know, there was something going on. You know, they had Brian Eno at that stage sitting at the back with his VCS3 at the back mm. of the hall, you know, kind of mixing the sound and interfering. Um, and that was interesting. And, uh, and that's what got them a record really, deal, really. It's extraordinary it? to think that you, you, you're thinking, was that in a cinema? And I'm thinking to myself, yes, it was in a cinema because I read that piece. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing to think. But you know, you read those things all those years ago, and you it just implanted ideas in your head that stayed there. Yeah, well, that's what had happened to me for sure. With yeah, what I read, of course. You know, right. Yeah, it's just extraordinary. And you can repeat whole sentences you read in music papers. Yeah. Yeah. Then 50 years ago or whatever. Well, it was your only source of information about it that was, stuff. And so it? it was incredibly precious, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also there was the feeling that you had, you know, I always felt how valuable it was to have to work hard to get to the stuff you, that, that to, you know, completely turned you around. Um, you know, my daughter, <laughs> my daughter said to me the other day, she'd been listening to um, Roll Over Beethoven, the Chuck, you know, the original Chuck Berry. And she said, she said, do you know what the lyrics are? She said, going to write a little letter, going to send it to my local DJ. There's a rocking little record I want my jockey to play. And, yeah. you know, she's a child of the social media age and streaming yeah. and all that. You know, she doesn't even have a record player, loves music. But, you know, the idea that the only way to hear this record was to, was to write, write a letter and <laughs> play it. And I, I, you know, because so, you, you know, when you discovered something, it became very, very precious to you oh absolutely because it was really hard to do wasn't it it didn't come your way at all so you 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 ended up round about this time talking about roxy music not long after this working for island records yeah how did that well, come about then did, did chris blackwell approach you or, or well, was it because of um there were um island had offered a trip to jamaica this was at a time when reggae was completely unfashionable you know, reggae was fatty boom boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Desmond Decker. And, yeah, rock, rock fans despised it. Yeah, yeah. So Ireland offered a trip to Jamaica. This would be 1972, uh, and they offered it to Michael Watts, who couldn't go, and it got passed on to me. Now, I really wanted to go, um, and the idea was to go and meet Chris Blackwell in Jamaica and just hang around and list some reggae records being made. And nobody thought that sounded very exciting. So I went, got there and met Blackwell. And he said, well, tomorrow, he said, I've got this group called The Whalers that I'm recording. <laughs> I said, oh, I know about them. How did I know about them? Because in 1965 or six, six, I think, I bought this. All right. Put it on by the Whalers right. and the follow-up single, and I loved it. Loved that record 
to death and I had no idea you know there are no composer credits on that label and no I had no idea who they were it's just a brilliant brilliant record um as was the follow-up so you know there's obviously something there so I told him I knew about this he said oh that's good um yeah he said Bob Marley a really interesting guy was the lead singer so we went to Harry Jay's studio um where they were recording uh, Catch a Fire, what turned out to be Catch a Fire. And Blackwell had done a very unusual thing. He'd given these guys uh, a lump of money to make an album. Nobody did that in reggae at the time. You know, they get, you got $25 to make a single Jamaican dollar. Um, but he'd given, I can't remember, 12,000 pounds or something for, to make a whole album. And I can't tell you how great it sounded in the studio. I mean, it was just sensational. And I talked to Marley a bit. Um, and the next day we went to Dynamic Sounds where Toots and the Motors were recording with the rhythm section there. And that was fantastic too. But there was something different about what the Whalers were doing. And I came back and wrote a piece um, saying that, you know, if there was going to be a Jamaican, Sly Stone or Curtis Mayfield or Marvin Gaye, this was going to be it. This bloke, Bob Marley and this group, the Whalers, which kind of turned out to be true. I suppose. Mm -hmm. There's Polaroid I took, actually. Can you see that? Let's see. That's oh, Bob what? On, in the hotel, Skyline Hotel in Kingston, on the day that he signed his contract with, um, with Blackwell. <laughs> Fantastic. Had to sign the contract. <laughs> um, so that was pretty amazing. So how did that lead to a job? Oh, uh, well, I got on with Blackwell. Um, very well. And I'd been around Ireland in their old offices in Basing Street in Notting Hill, you know, to interview various people over the preceding year or two. Um, and then the next I heard was that Muff Winwood, who'd been the head of A&R, who was the bass player with the Spencer Davis group, was moving over from A&R to run the studios. And they, were, you know, they obviously wanted somebody. Um, so they got in touch and I went and talked to them. And, did they want you to sign a particular type of act? No, no specification whatsoever. Um, you know, and I had dreams of being John Hammond or Ahmet Ertegun or Jerry yeah. Wayne or somebody, you know, as, as you would. Um, and it was very interesting. I was there for three years. The um, uh, company was changing quite a lot, growing very fast. Roxy, The Whalers, Traffic, Sparks, all those things. Um, my own, I mean, my, they, what did I do while I was there? Uh, you got the Richard signed, and Linda Thompson record released, didn't you? Yeah, I got that released, yeah. yeah. Um, I signed Pete Wingfield, um, who I think is a previous, uh, yeah. So, so, Bright Lights Tonight, let's just talk about this for a second. Okay. I want to see the Bright Lights Tonight. White is still regarded as one of the great records. They made it and they weren't, nobody was going to put it out, were they? Is that right? Yeah. Um, Henry the Human Fly, which was Richard's <laughs> first solo album. I, I think they had great hopes for that and it had been a disaster. Nobody bought it at all. Um, and Richard had gone off and uh, made this record with Linda um, and brought it to the company a few months before I joined. And you know, probably people had other things on their minds and just nobody was interested. Um, and it had been put on the shelf. And I think it was John Wood, the engineer, um, who engineered all those Joe Boyd, Witch Season, Fairport, blah, blah, records. Um, I knew John and I think he got in touch and said, you know, there's this record Richard's made that, you know, you should hear so I think he gave me uh, a tape and I listened to it and you know it was obviously fantastic and I you know I liked Richard anyway from Fairport um, so it was a fairly simple step to to get it released and people loved it and it's you know I want to see the bright lights might have you know might have been a hit single might have been. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was an era when odd things were, yeah. were, were being hit. Yeah. So. a brass band on it. So it was a good <laughs> band. Band. Peter Skellen. Uh, um, yep. Anyway, but it was obviously a, a good thing to do. 
Yeah. So that must have been a real kick, though, wasn't it? For a guy who had been a fan and written music paper for the music papers, suddenly being able to say, I can get that record released. It's yeah. A bit of power, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And then, then I managed to sign two uh, ex members of the Velvet Underground, Kale and John Kale and Nico, which was also. Fun right. in a different kind of way. Um, that was that was interesting. Um, if you uh, if you can see that jacket, right. I, yes, that belonged to John Cale. All right. <laughs> I've been doing a bit of set dressing. Okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> I bought that. I bought that off him for for. I, I'd admired he'd been wearing it, and I'd admired it. You can't probably see it. it's kind of blue with a yellow striped velvet, quite wide lapels. Yeah, it would be 1970. Four or five, um, and uh, one day he said, "He said, you want to buy my jacket?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah." He said, "Fiver." So I gave him a, I, what he needed a fiver for. So it absolutely urgently, I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't suppose it would fit either of us now. Anyway, so I won't bother sending it back. So what made you, so you left Ireland, what, after, after three years, you say, to yeah. go back to journalism? You went back, yeah. to, you edited The Melody Maker, didn't you? For, for yeah, I went, back to, well, I went back to, I went back to journalism because I just had a happier relationship with a typewriter as they were then than with a pocket calculator, basically. Yeah. Um, and I, I decided I wasn't going to be Jerry Wexler, sadly. Um, and it, it was a funny time in music. You know, there's a lot of crap around, and I couldn't find my way to something really, really great. Um, there we are. So I went back to journalism, and I actually the first thing I did was edit Time Out for oh yes for two years for Tony Elliott, which was really interesting because you know as well as music, there was film and theatre and dance and, and also the whole market was so buoyant the advertising market was so buoyant that uh, that, that really editors were kind of left alone weren't they at that stage absolutely there wasn't much intervention because the money being made was astonishing yeah it was and you know it went, the melody maker and the enemy too um you know when whenever somebody signed to vertigo you know and had their first album out whoever they were you know they had a full page ad yeah they did. yeah you know hundreds and hundreds of pounds at the time um, so yeah, it was so you, you and obviously you know IPC who owned those music papers. You know they just thought, well, this is coining it for us. Do you remember it any covers of the Melody Maker at that time? You were particularly proud of uh, I... the Melody Maker. You know the Melody Ray Coleman, who was the editor after Jack Hutton left. Um, so he was, my, you know, I was his deputy for a while. He saw it as a newspaper, not mm. as a magazine. Yeah. So the MM always had that. You had to have a story on the front page, mm. Uh, mm. a news story, you know, whether it was. I still remember some of his headlines. Bay City Bonkers, Wings Metal Fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. <laughs> the low point, I always thought, was a picture, <laughs> yeah. a picture of... Um, Leo Sayre in a kind of 20s suit with Leo's Gatsby look. <laughs> we all we all looked a bit of scared. It must have been flying yeah. off the stands that week. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, at that point, you know, we were selling 200,000 copies a week mm. and nobody, mm. it didn't really matter, what, you know, in a way for a long, because people were going to buy it anyway for yeah, a, yeah. a while until things changed a bit. Um, but so... Covers. Um, do I remember covers? Not really. Right, right. It wasn't really a covers. No. There was a good, Mary Harron wrote a great story about Andy Warhol, and we did a Warhol cover. I remember that quite late on. Yeah. So, what happened after that, after your, after your time back at the Melody Maker? Um, I left the Melody Maker. Do you remember there was a strike? There was an IPC strike? There was always an IPC strike. I remember it vividly. 1980. Yeah, 1980. It was in about May 1980. They leaned on me to put out what we would have called in those days a scab issue, uh. in other words, without any of the stuff. And I didn't want to do that. So I left. Um, uh, and we were just about to relaunch it, actually. So I don't know whether that would have been good or not. Um, 
and left and then and freelance for a bit and then joined the Times. Um, uh, partly because Murdoch had just, well, I'd written for the Times as a freelance for a long time, reviewing. Um, and then Murdoch bought it and he wanted to do a kind of listings thing um, in it. Harry Evans had taken over as editor. And, you know, I knew people at the Times. I'd edited Time Out, so I knew how to do listings. Um, so I went there, joined the staff, did that thing, which was a sort of section called preview uh, or arts stuff. And then I became deputy sports editor and then I became features editor. So, you know, I was there for 10 years. Right, right. And not doing very much music. Well, some, some music writing, but not a huge amount. Uh, and then I went to the Independent on Sunday. Then I started writing about sport, and then I went to the Guardian. How did you? What's the What's the biggest difference between the world of sports journalism and the world of music journalism? <laughs> um, the difference is you have a result to write about. You know, somebody won one nil or won by an innings and a hundred runs, or you know, or you, you can measure that they ran a hundred meters in one point three five. That's seven. a really good point. Because with most music, with possible exception of jazz, you kind of roughly know what's going to happen. Jazz, there is this sort of uncertainty that you may well, not know. Well, that's one of the reasons I like jazz so much. You know, you yeah. go to a jazz club, it's like going into a sports arena. Um, you know what the rules are, and, but you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I like that very much. Uh, but also, I don't know whether you found this sometimes, writing about music can be exhausting as a critic. Um, because it's abstract and you're, yeah. trying, you're trying to describe Absolutely. something that's not. It's incredibly hard, which people don't realise. Yeah. You're writing about something you can't see, which is well, why most journalism is either yeah. about the CV of the person, their life, or the way things look. Yeah. Yeah. And so sport is a lot easier in, in that respect. Yeah. But it's much more yeah. difficult. It's more difficult technically because, you know, you have to know the rules in a way that you don't necessarily have to know the rules of music. You know, you don't have to know, no, sure. you know, a G minor scale is to yeah. write about David Bowie, apparently. Um, but you, uh, you do have to know a bit more about the various sports when you write about them. Um, and it's more taxing in the sense that you're always filing to very tight deadlines. You know, you're writing at a match, writing while the match is on. Um, but I'd done a bit of that when I was on local paper, so in you know, in quite primitive circumstances. So, yeah, you used to you used to presumably just dictate reviews down a down a down a phone to a, to a to a copy taker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in in the early, especially when I was writing for the Times in the early seventies, um, everything had to be printed in the next published in the next morning's paper yeah so you know i'd have to you know if i was at the festival hall or somewhere or so you're effectively there. reviewing it during the gig and you'd have to go out and find a phone a pay phone because there weren't any mobiles you know you'd, you'd go and find and, and talk your review dictate it to the copy taker yeah which led to some pretty amusing um misunderstandings um but uh it was very good training all that for yeah. anything that journalism might throw at you. So what stuff have you got there? Have you got some old records and things that you've, you were, other records you were going to show us? Oh, well, I can show you lots of things. But, um, uh, yeah, well, well we, we've sort of jumped past the history. Um, but the two really important records to me after Lonnie Donegan and Glenn Miller yeah, yeah. Um, and The Shadows were that... Right, Mount yeah, Osborne. On Fontana, where? On Fontana, yeah, it was at CBS in America, Columbia in America. Yeah, right. On Fontana. And, Fontana. and that, I thought, when I saw that, I thought that's the coolest thing I have ever seen in my life. Right. Um, and, it, and the music sounded exactly the same way. And I still think the title track of that, Milestones, is the probably the peak moment of Western civilization. Right. Um, you know, unimprovable. Yeah, one of those perfect things. Oh, and the other. That's the other thing. When I was at school, we had a jazz society with about five members. Um, <laughs> one of the, one of the boys came in with that, and that was 
an absolute revelation. Yes. Muddy you see, hearing stuff like this in a school classroom was so much of a part of growing up in the 60s, wasn't it? You, know, you so often did hear it on a school record player. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can I tell you my other school story? Yes. Um, we had a, a, a sort of classical music society, which I was also in, which had about maybe 40 or 50 members. And one of the perks of being in the classical music society was that you got to be an usher at concerts. At, we, in Nottingham, we had an Albert Hall, which was like a kind of the th like the Albert Hall, but probably half the size. And it's where the classical concerts were. And occasionally other sorts of events. And in March 1964, it was announced that the Rolling Stones would play there. Same rules for the music society. You got to usher, you know. <laughs> Normally it would be Beethoven or Marla or something, but it's the Rolling Stones. So immediately there were 500 applications to join. Join the, the classical music society. <laughs> <laughs> but with me being a... <laughs> Me being a, a, a member in good standing, you know, I, I was one of those who got the gig. And the, um, the intro was you had to go in your school uniform. Oh, <laughs> oh, <God>. oh. <laughs> you know, suit or blazer, tie. I hope you loosened the tie. <laughs> and the the gig I got was to, it was, it was the Albert Hall was like the real Albert Hall in that it had a sort of choir behind the, at the back of the stage you know, kind of choir yeah. raised sort of tears with seats, which they sold to audience. So I had to go and sit immediately behind Charlie Watts as the kind of bouncer, you know, <laughs> to stop people in tree. So, <laughs> of course, this was uh, not fade away, just got to number one. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me. So, constantly throughout this very very good but quite short set I and mean, they played for about half an hour i suppose um i had to keep jumping up and pulling girls off charlie's back <laughs> in your school <laughs> uniform in, in my your school uniform yeah many of these girls known to me <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> yes not not in their school uniform <laughs> uh anyway it's a memorable night and we got to go into their dressing room at the end of the show and Charlie, as an appreciation, gave me his drumsticks. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Only one survived. You can see it's Charlie Watts drumstick because that's where it's chewed, you know, where he's rim hitting rim shots. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, yeah. It's chewed up. I had two of them. I mean, I had the pair. But afterwards, I went to the local. Oh, and I got all their autographs, all five of them, with Brian, um, on a napkin or something. And then afterwards, I went to the local coffee bar and bumped into this girl that I rather fancied. And I Good to impress her. Yeah. And one of the drum, drumsticks, which is why I've only got one drumstick. Oh, well. And the autograph. <laughs> and it did me no good at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, look, Mark, we, we were saying that, you know, writing about music is a very hard thing to do, and most people avoid it by writing about a career and everything else instead of music. But you still do it, and you do it in an excellent blog called The Blue Moment. Tell us about that. Well, uh, the title comes from a book I wrote about Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, which I think of, of as being a kind of pivotal point in the evolution of of modern music not just jazz but also or you know even the velvet underground and roxy music and all kinds of things um so i wrote a book about that and that's the title but then when i left the guardian uh and left sort of staff employment about nine years ago um one of the things i wanted to do was write about music in the way that i'd been able to write about it for the melody maker in the early 70s when there were no restrictions, nobody said, oh, give me a pitch. You know, you didn't have to pitch mm. anything. You just, if you wanted to go and interview Pink Floyd, you interviewed Pink Floyd. If you wanted to write about spontaneous music ensemble, you wrote about them um, without having to ask permission or even ask how long the piece should be. You know, you <laughs> know whatever you thought and within reason it went in. So I wanted to have that feeling again. I didn't want to deal with any... I didn't want to have to deal with explaining stuff to people. So I thought, well, 
you know, nobody's going to pay me for this, but I'll do it anyway, because it's just going to be fun to do, I think. And I suppose I've written 700 odd pieces for it now over the years. And people uh, ever come to you and say, we'd like to print that as it stands? Uh, no. No, they don't. And I think that's because I write it in a, in a rather conversational kind of way. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not it's not really intended for it's not intended to be in print. Yeah. Um, and it's not intended to make money. People also say, why don't you monetize it? <laughs> um, and I think, well, if I tried to do that, I think it would change the nature of it completely. Yeah. I'd start looking at the stats yeah yeah and i'd start thinking oh when i wrote about hendrix you know i got four did this <laughs> yes i must do more of that exactly. wrote about some obscure uh, piece of german free jazz you know um and i don't want to think like that i want to think like i was thinking you know in 1971 yeah. or something. and it's very satisfying um uh yeah uh, so that that has brought me a vehicle for the same kind of enthusiasm. Yeah. Well, it, well it, it's much valued by people who read it. It's, um, it's terrific. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's one, of a, one of a kind. So we traditionally finish these chats by asking people to tell us the greatest record ever made. Now I know it's a stupid question. Yeah. You, may, you may have already answered the question, or you may have a, another one up your sleeve. Do you? Well, I, I have here down here, I've got my box of the 100 greatest singles ever made. Oh, okay. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Break glass in place. It's narrowed it down to 100 just... anyway. That's good. <laughs> it, it's, you know, the, the, the number one is probably not Your Ma Said You Cried in Your Sleep Last Night by Kenny Dino. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a new one on me. Could be. Uh, no, I just, I think it's. I've narrowed it down actually. Oh. I've narrowed it down to. To five. Um, Caroline, no. Uh, of course. Oh right, of yes. course. And yeah. uh, Brian Wilson, not the Beach Boys. Nope. By Caroline, no. By Brian Wilson. Was it, it? That's how he came out originally, was it? Yeah, in America. That's right. Um, Go Now by Bessie Banks. Yeah, of course. Yeah. On, on Dave Godin's Soul City label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will You Love Me Tomorrow by the Shirelle. Oh, of course, on the old top rank label. Oh, what a joy. Um, I'm not ashamed of this. Bruce because. Springsteen. Born to run, but you, you're not run. wrong. You're not wrong. Parts one and two. But number one. You're going to have to lift it up a bit. I can't yeah. see you there. Which Tracks of My Tears by The Miracles. Not Smokey Robinson and The Miracles. No, no. The no, Miracles. No, no. no. This was about a year before uh, they became Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, but of course it was Smokey Robinson. And it's also one of those rare records where, you know, a, an absolute classic, a work of genius, where the B-side, A Fork in the Road, is just as good. Who is it? Um, you know, how many of those are there? Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, yeah. um, His Latest Flame, Little Sister, Elvis, you know, one or two others maybe. So, Tracks of My Tears. It's very been, good. You know, it's been that way since 1965. And why change now? Why change it precisely? Absolutely. Very good. Oh, it's been lovely to talk to you. That was <laughs> thoroughly entertaining. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.